Chapter 13 Saturday, the 8th of October 2016, 9.30 a.m. Riverport, Massachusetts It's really quiet out there. Nick was driving slow and steady, sitting low behind the wheel, staring ahead from behind his sunglasses. Riverport at 9.30 on a Saturday morning should have been livelier. Even in autumn, with most of the college crowd still away on vacation, people should have been lining up for coffee. There should have been traffic. Buskers along Main Street area should have been laying out hats and guitar cases for the day. Not today. This morning, everyone's intention was on the university. If they weren't laying wreaths, pinning photographs to memorial boards at the site, or just paying their respects, they were moving at half speed, processing what it meant to be on the news. You sure they can't track me? The breathalyzer's vitals were laid out in the front seat, next to the webcam and Nick's smashed coffee machine. Beth was in the back seat, Jack lying out of sight with his head over her lap. You're good, though the cops and Monarch will be looking for your license plate. She glanced at Jack, the face of Riverport's tragedy. Massachusetts Bin Laden, thanks to Hatch's evocative on-air summary that morning. We should ditch the cab as soon as we can. She had gone over Jack, checking for injuries. Found nothing save for a little modeling where cuts and scrapes were quickly healed over. They were supposed to be the solution, Nick said. Who was? You were monarch, jobs, a future, hope. You told us you'd save us. Belth felt that, wanted to rebuke it. She wasn't monarch. She was never monarch. She was inside monarch to bring monarch down. But Nick was right. She hasn't succeeded in preventing anything. What's her favorite movie, Nick? Happy Gilmore? Do me a favor and say Star Wars. I don't like art films. You know that bit in The Matrix when Neo works out how to glitch it? He games the system, gets superpowers, rewrites reality? Sure. In this story, Neo is monarch. The Matrix is planet Earth. The hack is money, influence, shamelessness, lies, entitlement, not giving a fuck and an overwhelming lack of critical thought on our part. In actual powers. So there it was. What tipped you off? Monica waiting in my house. Figured they had to be watching Jack, so I watched his place for a while before coming in. You know what I saw? The moment Jack's house blew up, a dozen Monarch goons popped into existence and dropped dead simultaneously. At the same time, a bear cat materialized out of thin air and exploded on his front drive. Also, your boyfriend looks like ground beef when you rolled him into the back seat. Now he looks fine. Cab rolled to a stop at a red light. Nick glanced at Beth in the rear view. This is some deep black bullshit. X Files, Alex Jones, Area 51, something like that. Beth glanced away from traffic to look at Nick in the eye. It is a conspiracy. It does go all the way up. It involves other dimensions. It was all planned. He glanced at her again, then back to the road, saying nothing. Jack risked lifting his head, peering out at the street. Looks like the end of the world out there. Outside was the wide expanse of river on one side and rows of uncared for rare houses on the other. Nick had navigated them carefully around Main Street's periphery, sticking to the back roads when he could, eventually taking down a rutted service track by the river. Who built a swimming hall out here? This was residential back in the day, Beth said. A three legged dog skipped across the busted curb in front of them glancing self-consciously at them before disappearing into the weeds. Way, way back in the day. Jack sat upright, Beth's hand still thimble-clipped into her rig, slipped from his shoulder. Will didn't buy this place for the view. Jack looked at her hands, traced a finger along the rubberized thimble, covering her thumb to the first point, and then insulated wiring the lead to the wrist clip the same color and material. Zero state mobility rig, she said. The Exo carries its own chronon charge, maintaining my personal MJ field. Even a complete causality vacuum, it means I could walk around in a stutter. As long as the charge lasts. The bridge was ahead. The address put the swimming hall directly beneath it. Before we do this, Jack said, I need a few answers. That morning on Bannerman's Overlook. That show with Aberfoil, the chop shot, the yachts. What happened to Haberfoil and his men? The timing. The way nobody came to ask us questions. How... Do you like Douglas Adams? She said. The writer? 
He wrote that the knack of flying lies in learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. And? Same thing? Jack thought about that. No, it isn't. Here we are. Beth was pointing at a decrepit building shoved snug beneath the bridge. It was completely unremarkable. The faded signage, half lost to gravity and vegetation, read, B.R. Burry Swimming Hall. Beth was out of the cab, making a line for the place. Jack followed. Colonies of seagulls and pigeons populated the underside ribbing of that third-rate bridge. Thin stalk greenery reached up against stanchions supported by crumbling brickwork. Even the graffiti had been updated since the 90s. The hall was broad as the bridge itself and built from the same brickwork. Two levels, all the windows barred and boarded over. Double doors of steel banded wood sat square in the middle of the construction, falling apart sign overhead. Steps led up to the door, a concrete wheelchair ramp swerving up from the side. Grass and vegetation had spent a decade or two undermining the concrete brickwork, splitting green explosions reaching for the bridged over sky. Beth turned back to the cab. Nick, you got a crowbar? Tire iron? Something? Nick, out of the car, clicked his tongue and gave her pistol fingers in the affirmative before jogging around to the trunk. So, Jack said, trying to be casual, did you... see anyone while you were away? A guy? Not really. Oh. I had a lot to get done in that time. Well, there was this one guy, I guess. One guy who? Nick jogged over. Here you go. Beth took the tire iron, tested the heft, moved over the door. Jack sidled over, dropped his voice to whisper. Was it serious? Beth was busy trying to wedge the iron between the two doors. Are you... in touch? Beth stopped what she was doing, looking him in the eye, and said his name in the most well-meaning tone she could manage. Jack. He got the hint. She got the tire iron in there, started sawing the other end to it to and fro. Jack found it oddly uncomfortable to watch, looking away. Metal and wood complained, splintered, finally popped. I think I got it. Jack grabbed the handle on one of the doors. She got the other. Sure enough, the lock had fallen apart as it separated from the housing. The door shrieked across the concrete. Beth surveyed what this revealed. Oh, get bent! A proper actual security door. Thick, metal, heavy, and coated lock. Nick whistled. Whew. He wasn't screwing around. Beth gestured at it. Where'd your brother get that? NORAD? Wait a sec. Jack stepped up to it. The code lock looked like it still had power. He punched in six digits. Waited. From deep within the door's body came a weighty triple thunk. Just like that. The half-ton iron door popped loose, opening an inch. Beth examined it, looked at Jack. My birth date, he said. Huh. Beth pushed the door open easily. After you. Hey. Nick was waiting, 20 feet back, shifting uncertainly on his feet. Your brother, uh, he wouldn't... There's not like shotguns and tripwires or claymores. He wouldn't have stuff like that set up, right? He wasn't that kind of dude? Uh, that's a serious door is all I'm saying. Beth glanced at Jack. Jack shrugged. Beth went in first, slowly. Jack followed, stepping into the twilight foyer of the swimming hall. Light struggled through soaped-up ceiling-level windows, revealing a cold, thickly-aired time capsule to the mid-90s, lit by what light filtered through. There was signage from the 1996 Riverport swim meet. Fun in the sun. A wetly disintegrating corkboard that still held rainbow pushpins and handwritten ads for secondhand flippers and puppies that needed good homes. A dusty arcade cabinet stood in the corner, its colorful cartoons sliding, peeling away in the particle board beneath coming out in leprous prints. Jack faux retched. Tastes like the inside of an air conditioner in here. The counter faced turnstiles, which led to floor to ceiling swinging doors, the kind that made Jack think of a hospital. A laminated sign announced the pool would be shutting down for good on March 1st, and the staff thanked everyone who had been swimming there, some of them for 50 years. A few photographs curled on the floor beneath the sign, sticky tape yellowed and withered on the corners. Jack examined one. Three old guys holding up a black and white of their younger selves at the same pool, not long after the end of the Second World War. 
he let it go. Nick stuck his head in. It smells like feet. He tentatively stepped inside, and not the good kind. Whatever that meant. Jack opened a cardboard box, dug through the report cards, all grades declining over time. The shrink-wrapped comics and came up with a framed color photograph of a white mouse in a cage next to... That looks like Monarch's machine, Beth said. A model version of it. Nick wandered over. Monarch has a machine? What kind of machine? The device in the photograph was small, mouse size, and certainly not built with aesthetics in mind. All exposed ribbing and loose wires. Written neatly in Sharpie were the words, In memory of Schrodinger, the world's first time traveler. Beneath that was a $12,000 bill from a moving company. Pickup address was from home, Jack said. Dated 1999. Delivery address here. Jack put down the bill, smoothed it thoughtfully on the two-tone boomerang pattern for Micah countertop, and then took the turnstiles out of vault. Booming through the push doors granted a deep vista of dim light and deep shadows. The doors banged against the tiled walls, echoed off of the opposite end of the hall, and then back again. He wheeled around to Beth and Nick. Can we get power in here? Beth took the more civilized route through the turnstiles. You think there's going to be power after all these years? Jack couldn't see much of anything. Anemic light filtered through filthy glass that lined and raised the middle section of the roof, but it was still pretty murky in there. He could make out the doubly dark depression of the Olympic-sized pool and the few things covered in canvas against the walls on the other side. Nick came in, working his phone. No calls, Beth reminded him. Chill, sister. He held up his glowing phone, just making light of the situation. He thumbed an icon and the LED flashlight kicked in. Nick strolled around, playing the light across the walls. You see all this cabling? Industrial. Well, hello. Nick's phone lit up a large yellow metal prism, about 8 feet high and maybe 15 long. Stacked next to it were four 44-gallon drums. One of them fitted with a worn metal hand pump. Jack took a closer look. What is that? Generator, Beth said, her own phone light light up and probing. Diesel, judging by the drums. This thing's hefty, Nick observed. The enclosure keeps it quiet. You were saying something about your brother having a machine? Jack glanced at Beth. He swung her light down to the base of the generator, followed the mass of cabling across the floor to where it dropped down into a dry pool. Jack and Nick followed suit. As one, the three pools of light tracked the path of the insulated lines across the mold-encrusted tiles, over workstations set up on folding tables, to the textured steel of an access ramp to the massive circular construction that dominated the deep end. Silence until Nick said what nobody was thinking. Your brother found a fucking UFO? Beth snorted. No, Nick, that's crazy. Jack jumped into the pool. It's a time machine. We gotta get the lights on, Beth said. Nick, you seem to know something about this. Can you get the generator to run? Time machine? Nick. Uh, yeah, sh sure, sure. Jack was exploring the benighted guts of the swimming pool, scanning the contents of various workstations that Will had set up. Computers, diagnostic equipment, a lot of stuff I remember from when I was a kid. He had all the setup in the barn, except the laptops. Those are new. Nick called out, Hey guys! The generator thudded to life. I think someone's been here. Beth checked the drums against the wall near the generator housing. Jerry can's here. Not as dusty as the 44s. Nick might be right. Nick found the breaker box, flipped it, and long racks of fluorescent overhead sputtered and snapped discordantly, lying Will's laboratory bare. Hunkered in the deep end of the swimming pool, taking up the whole space, was a knit bashed looking version of the machine he had seen in the university lab. Ring corridor, airlock, and at the center of it, a geometric sphere connected to the rest of it by knots of heavy gauge cabling. Monarch's project was neat and clean and tooled. This thing looked like it could have been powered by an old Buick. It was a scrap metal and solder with occasional touches of tungsten and titanium where it counted. Around the core, for instance. By the ramp was an old laptop on a burnished trolley. The laptop was open a fluorescent green flash drive jutting from the side connector. Taped to the top of the screen was a note in Will's handwriting. It read, Message for September on flash drive. Jack pressed the laptop power stud. The computer pieced its thoughts together and booted the OS. Do you think he wanted someone to find this? Beth dropped into the pool. 
check the laptop. So he and someone else used this place as a monthly drop point, a way to stay in touch off grid. September was the last one. I wonder what year. Jack checked the flash drive's directory. Just one video file. Let's see who he's talking to. His finger hovered above the mouse button. Jack, you okay? This might be the last time Jack heard his brother's voice say something new. The last time he would see his brother alive. He clicked the file. The player popped open. The view seesawed as Will got to the angle right. July 4th, Will said. 2010. He had recorded the message here on his laptop. The background was the workstations, the shallow end of the dry pool, the swinging exit doors. September, I hope you receive this. A chill in his chest. September's a... person, Beth concluded. The video continued. I, uh, I've come back here because I've left no choice. It happened. The countermeasure was finished, completed, ready to use. I went to my workshop by the docks. It's a disaster. The countermeasure, it's, it's, it's gone. Taken. I'm hoping to God you have it because whoever took it... Will shuddered, both hands now gripping his head. The workshop was destroyed. Utterly destroyed. I need to know for sure. If what you say is true, then someday our lives may depend on my knowing the truth about what has happened. Contact me. Find me. Please. The video ended. Jack closed the laptop. Countermeasure? I don't know. I think you do. I don't. Nick was watching from the far end of the hall, wondering why Mom and Dad were fighting. Jack let it go. I say we get this thing fired up. Beth wasn't convinced. Safe cracking I can wing my way through, but kickstarting a time machine is one of the few things not covered on the internet. Paul walked me through it. I think I could do it again. How different can it be? That's not my concern. My concern is that this is a time machine, Jack. As a student of popular culture, I have no desire to go the full Bradbury. Think about it. We fire this up. We go back to before the diversity incident. We get in there. We stop it. And this never happens. Beth shook her head. I know you know that's not possible. Of course it's possible. We have a... Her hands came up. T for time out. Stop. This isn't about going back earlier. It's about causality. We are here having this conversation because the university happened. If we could go back and prevent the university event from happening, and we can't, then causality would fall apart. Jack's expression was stage one grief. She felt like she'd kicked a dog. We go back, Jack. Of that, I'm certain. And it doesn't play out the way we'd like. You want to explain that? We're in your brother's hidden lab. He left a message for someone he's collaborated with for something called countermeasure. A measure that counters. The only time machine related thing that needs countering right now is the fracture. He just said that the countermeasure was taken on July 4th, 2010. It sounds to me like there's a chance that we're the ones who took it. Maybe that's what we do. Take it, bring it back to our time and fix the fracture. And you just piece that all together? It's a theory. And you think that I don't notice who that message is addressed to? September? Beth's heart sank. Go Team Outland, skinny weirdo with a... With a sniper rifle, I get it. You want to tell me what's really going on here, Zed? I honestly don't know if Will's message was meant for me, Jack. I don't know if September is a name I've given him at some point. That's the truth. I'm more interested in the date of that recording. You remember July 4th, 2010? How could he forget? 16 years ago. Paul, Zed, himself at the Overlook. Aberfoyle. Coincidence, you think? Coincidence that you disappeared the same day the countermeasure did? No, wait a minute, that's not... It's not what? Paul and I got woken up at 4am by three goons who then decided not to kill us because you called their boss. They drove us across town and you pull a magic trick on top of the Overlook. Will, who was being held at gunpoint across town, is suddenly released without question and later that day his workshop is trashed. Then both you and the countermeasure disappear on that same day. But hey, now you're back, you work for Monarch. Beth chewed her lip. That does look bad, doesn't it? Yeah, Zed, it looks pretty fucking bad. What do you need me to do? If you work for the other side, then I can't stop you doing whatever you're going to do next. All I could do is ask you not do it. I've always been on your side, even when I left. He didn't want his emotions to dictate what he'd said next. 
So he looked at the machine. Here's what I know, he said, trying to sound confident. A machine can only take me back as far as the moment of its activation. This machine was activated long before Monarch's, and it can get me back to just before Monarch University machine was activated. Then I can find Will. I can save him, and I can help us fix this. Complex arguments weren't his strength, but he did his best. Wait, hear me out. Just because right now it says I didn't go back and save Will doesn't mean I can't make the present, which I did. Proving that I can or can't change the past is impossible, right? Because whatever the present is, it's connected to a past built on causality that has denied all attempts at changing it. That doesn't mean creating one of those alternatives is possible. It just means proving that it's possible is impossible, right? All I could do is try and see what happens. Nick piped up from the back of the room. What? You really are Will's brother, she said. I had a few conversations like that back in the day. Maybe that's why I like you so much. Jack shrugged. So maybe stick around this time. Maybe I will. Saturday, 8th of October, 2016. 3.43 p.m. Outside of Riverport Swimming Hall. 5 hours and 37 minutes later. Beth snapped off a piece of grass. Adjusted her sunglasses. Amber light bounced intensely off the water. They say the river's coming back to life these days since the dock shut down. Beneath a bridge on the other side of the broad support across the swimming hall, reeds poked out of an artificial peninsula of accumulated trash. The ducks didn't seem to mind. Jack's eyes were on the one building that dominated Riverport's new skyline, Monarch Tower. The news is saying the gala's tonight, and it's going to be huge. The CEO is launching a whole range of promise the world bullshit. The building was an asymmetrical black obelisk, 50 floors high. The Monarch logo. A fragmented geometric butterfly glowed incarnating against the surface of glossy black glass. We call it Mordor, Beth said. We? Not everyone in that building is a reptile, Jack. Monarch does well because it delivers on most of his promises. Look around. Remember what Riverport was like when you left? It was devolving into this. She jerked a thumb toward the discarded neighborhood around them. Massachusetts flyover country, not even a second-rate cousin of Worcester. Six years later, look at it. Dog walkers and artisanal coffee and people who couldn't afford a trailer are now bitching about their McMansion not having a ping pong table. I'm going to use that machine, Beth. I have to. I know. I can go back early enough to stop Paul going through. You know, stop him turning into whatever he is now. You can try. You're right about that. You're not going to stop me? I would need to, Jack. You're very relaxed about this. Want to see a trick? Sure. Beth reached into her pocket, pulled out two sets of soft foam earplugs, handed one to Jack and put hers in. Jack did the same, skeptically. Then Beth pulled out a revolver. Uh, you got that where? Next glove compartment. She snapped the cylinder open, popped out all six shells, put one back in. The barrel chittered and she spun it. Then she snapped it shut. I've seen this movie. Knock it off. Beth pressed the barrel to her head. No. And fired. Click. Jack made a grab. She sidestepped. Click. He grabbed again. She deflected. Stop it! Click. Zed! The gun was still to her head. If I stop, you won't get it. Click. Jack punched her in the face. Her head jerked back. The gun discharged. The bullet flying at 45 degree angle past her head. It ate a piece of brickwood with a short, sharp shriek. Knock it off! He yelled, usefully having some sheet white. Fuck. I'm sorry. Fuck, are you... You were... She looked him in the eye, pissed off. Jammed the barrel to her temple and pulled. Click. When she took it away, there was a circular brand where the muzzle had kissed her. Then she threw it away. I can't die, she said, yanking the plugs out of her ears. I can't die because, when I was eight years old, I met my older self. I can't die because I haven't done that yet. I haven't gone back and not my younger self, you understand? I've always done whatever I wanted, knowing that at worst I'm looking at a hospital stay. Parkour, martial arts, hang gliding, skydiving, bungee jumping, hitchhiking, roof surfing, hanging out with pirates and reprobates, staying up too late, not looking before I cross the street. Everything that just went down at your old house. Free pass. Makes me a very, very good operative. Nobody gets to kill me. 
Nobody gets to take me down. The laws of causality won't permit it. She pointed back toward the swimming hall. I go through that machine, meet myself. I'm done. All bets are off. After that, I could develop an allergy to the fabric softener or drop dead. Choke on a fucking kiwi. The adrenaline was washing out of her, bumming her out. She leaned heavily against the brickwork. You wanted to know how I pulled off that magic trick on Bannerman Overlook? Now something to do with that. Same reason I'm not dead on the ground right now with Nick's gun in my hand. She stared at the reeds, tossed the plugs into them along with all the other trash. Jack had taken his out, was staring at her. You could have just fucking said so. It wouldn't have sunk in. You'll come to rely on me being capable. But what if I go through that machine, meet myself, and then from then on, I'm second guessing every move I make? You need to step up, no matter what it costs. If we fail, everything dies. And not meeting your younger self isn't an option, right? Right. If I don't then, I'm not here. We're not talking, and nobody is trying to stop Monarch. If my older self doesn't spirit my younger self away to string in West Coast and South American training camps, I don't become me, and there's nobody here to save the day. But it's not just me. You need to do the right thing, even if it means abandoning your brother, killing your friend, and anything at all that means we succeed. Be prepared to do things you never thought you'd have to, because the alternative is so much worse. Paul said something similar. We're both right, but he's gone about it the wrong way. That's all I know. She said her piece. Done. So the mission is this. We go back. We find the countermeasure. Find out what it does. And then most likely we'll get it back here. That done, we fix the fracture and save the world. Beth. Yes, Jack. We don't know what the countermeasure is. Or even what it looks like. No, but we know who has it. And where. The rest we improvise. Saturday, 8th of October, 2016, 4.37pm, Riverport Swing Hall. Nick patched up the coffee maker, found a few plastic cups in the cafe overlooking the pool, and made possible espresso with what was left of his pods. The three of them sat on the camp chairs in the pool next to Will's workstations. The sunlight through the filthy vertical skylights were blazing amber as they approached sunset. What do you remember about 2010? Beth asked. Nick shrugged. Best of times, worst of time, played center position on the ice and never knew my name. My face was on coffee mugs. I had my college ride and then I blew it. You? Jack shrugged. Sipped his coffee. Spent the first six months getting sick of my brother. The last six months looking for her. He jerked the thumb at Beth. What about you, Beth? Mm. First six months hanging out with this guy. Last six months in a compound in Arizona. Ran a lot. What kind of compound, like? Just a bunch of guys waiting for the end of the world. Ex-special forces. Thought they've seen the writing on the wall and made a few decisions. I was just there to learn. Guns and stuff. Mainly cognitive, mental and physical. Resolve, teamwork, judgment and adaptability. Discipline, stress control, multitasking. She finished her coffee. Surveyed Will's battered old machine. So you're really doing this, Nick said. Beth stood. Jack took her by the arm. If we do this, we're only going back six years. That's more than 15 years after you met yourself. You don't need to come along. Stay here. If I don't come back... I've made my peace. Don't psych me out now, Jack, okay? Let's do this. Her eyes were sharp, and her voice certain. Jack let it go. But he didn't like it. Jack went to refamiliarize himself with the instrumentation. Will's device being far more pervative than Monarch's. Beth didn't follow. She walked up the ramp. Paul said something similar. That's what Jack had said to Beth earlier. She stood at the machine airlock, palms against the hand-riveted metal frame. Paul had entered Monarch's machine and been reborn as something altogether different. Beth was on the same path. Both of them were attempting to save the world in their own way. Both of them thought they were right. Both of them knew the past couldn't be changed. Were dedicated to their cause, and she knew both of them would be reshaped by traveling through these machines. The machine shouldn't have smelled like anything more than age and industrial grease. But not so. It had a scent of its own. The lingering, meaty heaviness of... Death. She stepped inside the airlock. 
a heavy ten-foot square, iron chamber reminiscent of something submersible. It was clear just how heavy Monarch had based their design on Will's work. It was functionally identical. Clockwise for future travel, counterclockwise for past. Unlike the Monarch machine, this corridor was rigid, not self-assembling, at midnight dark in both directions. The stink grew more intense as she stood in the chamber. She exited. I think something might have died in there, she called out, hoping for an obvious answer. Jack was moving from console to console. Will wasted a lot of money on that security system if Raccoon can get in there. It's just old, alright? Nick, can you get us some juice? Jack's reasoning did not make her any feel any better. She glanced back into the darkened airlock. Interior details half-formed in the shadows. Beth suppressed a chill. Nick redirected power from the Ginny. There was a deep thunk, and the airlock interior illuminated under the power of an old-school filament bulb, which promptly popped. The corridor trembled as beneath the scenes the contraption's innards shifted and the core came online. Beth took a few careful steps backward down the ramp. The vibration joined forces with a secondary instability. The crashing and separating rhythms began to shake the components loose from the promenade. A distortion wave struggled into existence around the corridor ring, but was failing to become substantial. The shaking and thrashing built in strength as systems beneath the machine began to emit desperate, high-pitched alarms. This wasn't working. God damn it! No, Nick! We sit the power! Wheeling away from the destination console, Jack moved to reboot the core when Beth got in his way. No! What do you mean no? I'm trying again! The hell you are! Clearly something is wrong with this thing, and none of us have any idea what it is. If you damage it, we're boned. We can't stop trying. Will's notes are all over the place. Maybe we can... We'd have as much luck trying to repair the Large Hedron Collider. She sighed. And I've seen your brother's handwriting. We need an expert. Fortunately, I know where to get one. Dr. Sophia Amaral, head of Monarch's Cronon Research Division, and one of the handful of authorities on your brother's research worldwide. One of the few who risked their careers to give Will any credibility at all. She's a believer and she built the Monarch machine. Well, she and Dr. Kim. Which means she works in the tower. Works there, lives there, almost never leaves there. She's one of their highest value assets. What about this Dr. Kim? Dead, Beth said. Car accident, so they say. Sophia's pretty much it. Every tech head under her is working in compartmentalized divisions on a need to know. What about the people working at Paul University? There were a few people who had an operational understanding that we might have been able to exploit. Where? I kept tabs on them in case they became useful. But three weeks ago they vanished. One from the university and three from the Cronon division. Which leaves Sophia and probably Paul. And it's like you can invite Paul over for beers. No, Jack agreed. But he did invite me to the gala. When? Before you tried to explode him to death? Even then, he seemed pretty certain he wanted me to come up and check the place out. That's as good as giving yourself up. If it's just me, I can... Guys, Nick interjected. Listen, how about we relax tonight, okay? Wait until everyone's good and hungover tomorrow morning, then we can just pick her up when she ducks out for a post-bender hamburger, yeah? Beth shook her head. If I was Paul in this situation, with the university and Jack on the loose, and knowing Jack as well as I do... I'd keep her under lock and key, trot her out for tonight's performance, and then make her vanish till I needed her again. If we don't grab her tonight, we might as well get another chance. This was going to be a hard sell. My cover is still good. The only person who ID'd me at farm was Gibson, and he was in the house when it blew. I can get inside Monarch Tower, get close to Sophia, and get her out. You don't have any kind of powers. I can't die. How's that for a power? Nick blinked. Excuse me? Sure, Jack retorted. But you can be detained. You can still fail. You can't get her out of there alone. Her officer at the top level, just off the top level, is a helipad. You can fly. I was told I'd need it. Seriously, Jack, me alone is our best chance. He put his hands up, walked away. Fine, whatever, Zed, you're the boss. Nick and Beth sat in awkward, simmering silence as Jack climbed out of the pool and left the building. The slam of the security door echoed through the every chamber of the place. He still wants us to save his brother, she said. Though he could pass on some message in 2010 that might save Will's life in 2016. He's frustrated, but he'll be okay. Science isn't his thing, really. Nick nodded. Yeah, it's gotta be hard for a guy, twiddled his fingers. So, Nick said, 
You're Zed, huh?